Okay. We say that Fridays is a bit interactive, and just because the microphone's suddenly gone on doesn't mean we all go quiet, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Although that doesn't happen with Amrick, because when the microphone goes on, my mate reads. <laughs> um, I was listening to Alan O'Reilly uh, today, and he had his conference here. Yeah. And it, it's a lovely uh, message. Yeah. It's all quiet. Yes, yeah. See? <laughs> yeah? And I thought, it's not just young. No. It's like, when a Bible believer is preaching, we have it on everywhere. Oh, quiet. lovely. Let's hope, it <laughs> Let's hope it happens tonight then. No. Is that just emotion? No, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's good. No, I like it. The word faith, the word faith occurs in 231 verses in Scripture. 231. Now, we've said before, and those of you who have been in our meetings for some time will know the answer to this, but how many times does it occur in the Old Testament? Can anybody remember? You would think, if, I, if I'm not setting you up here, you would think that it would be, you know, 150 times, 100 times. When I first looked at this, I thought, yeah, it's got a, loads of times. You know, you read about the heroes of faith and all this, and they're all Old Testament characters. It's got to be 100 times, 150 times. If you look at it, and you put it in concordance, it appears twice. Just twice in the Old Testament. I found that mind-blowing. And I thought, there's got to be a reason for that. Why would it only occur twice in the Old Testament? And once, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 20, let me just read that to you. Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a froward generation, children in whom is no faith. So it's, it's looking on the negative there as if it's no faith. So that leaves just once, once in the Old Testament in Habakkuk 2, Habakkuk 2 verse 4. Behold his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. That's right, his faith. He weren't caught out there, was he? That's good, that is. His faith. The just shall live by his faith. Now you know in the New Testament, Romans 1.17, and we'll get down there later on, but Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Paul wrote that, the just shall live by faith. But in the Old Testament, it's by his faith. And I thought, that's interesting. So why is it just twice in the Old Testament that the word faith occurs? Once it's no faith, the other it's his faith. But in the New Testament, it's faith everywhere. Faith everywhere. You see, when you you become a Christian, when you first get saved, and you're looking at all this stuff, and you're just reading, like, um, with no set format, you're not really studying the Bible, just reading the Bible, and that's exactly what I did for, you know, the first few years. You're asking a lot of questions, you're trying to learn, but you're not really getting into the Scriptures, you're just reading it. And and especially if you've been given a modern, perverted Bible, and I was given a good news Bible that um, God actually drew pictures in, or so, uh, so, <laughs> so something said. Um, and so I read through that the first year and I thought, yeah, you know, this is the word of God. I never knew any different. And then you start getting down the version issue and you know where it went from there. But um, I start asking these questions down the line after that, thinking, well, how was somebody in the Old Testament saved when Jesus hadn't died? And then you ask the, the people who are in leadership, you, you ask them the question and you see them like panicking a little bit, thinking, well, I don't really know the answer, but you know, I'll try and cover up my ignorance and try and give you a... And I'm thinking, this doesn't make sense. So then you start looking in things yourself and all this kind of stuff. You know what it's like when you're studying, those that study the Bible. So, I'm going to walk you through a few things tonight, and it's just going to um, hopefully help you. Um, it will challenge you, uh, some of these things here, get you thinking. Like we said before, when you answer one Problem, so to speak, it creates another ten. You know, it's it's the Bible so deep, so big, and you've got to try and stay on the right road rather than going down an avenue where it can take you. So, my first question, really, sorry, to all of us uh, this evening, is this: is how are you saved now? Right now, you're Christians. You've come to church. If I went round the room saying, "How long have you been saved?" Some would say five years, ten years, you know, fifty years, whatever it is. How long have you been saved? How did you get saved? How are you saved? What would your answer be? How are you saved? I believe. 
by believing. By believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything else? Does a Jehovah's Witness believe in Jesus Christ? They would say they do. But they, we know, we know it's not the same way that we do. I understand that. But they would say they do. The Mormons believe in Jesus Christ. But we know it's different, of course. So it is believing. That is the answer, of course. But what else would you say? What scripture would you turn to? If I said to you, right, I'm not, I'm not a Christian. Lead me to the Lord. Don't all start panicking thinking I'm going to pick on you. But it, lead me to the Lord. What scripture would you take me to? Okay, Romans 10 9. Read that loud and clear, please. Somebody else got another scripture? Romans 10 9, Amrick. Romans 10 9. That if thou shalt uh, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart. Believe what? In thine heart. In thine heart. That Christ has raised thee from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Brilliant. Great verse. Great verse. Okay, we'll go there. Anybody else got one? Somebody turn to Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Somebody read that. And somebody else please get 2 Timothy 3, 15. 2 Timothy 3, 15. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should follow. What a verse. Well, what are two verses? By grace are ye saved through what? Faith. We're looking at the word faith. We're talking about faith. No faith in the Old Testament. His faith in the Old Testament. Suddenly faith throughout the New Testament. And you are saved. By grace are ye saved through faith. Exactly what you said, Tony. Believing. Having faith. Believing. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. So you cannot work for your salvation, you cannot earn your salvation, you cannot get a place in heaven because of something that you have done or attained. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. If it was by works, you could boast in yourself, of course. Okay, 2 Timothy 3.15, somebody, loud and clear. And that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, Right, that last, able to make thee wise unto salvation. What's the last bit, Tony? Through faith. faith, Which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Believing, having faith in Christ Jesus. That's how we're saved. Now, if somebody, you know, you're talking to somebody, you're witnessing to them, and suddenly you you get to that stage where you think, I ought to ask them. Do you, want to, do you want to get saved? Do you want to be saved from hell? And do you want to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? You read them the scriptures and they say, yeah, right, you know, I want to get saved. You lead them to the Lord. You know, and you've got... It's so frustrating with so many people saying so many different things in the world, so many voices, so to speak, but everybody has their own set little format and saying, you can't say this and you don't do this and, you know, you've got to mention the word repentant, you've got to get... Listen, the Lord... One guy, he said this, he heard a, he had a scripture text when he was working on a workbench in a factory once and the scripture text, um, which he heard, that led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. One verse. It's not like um, you know, having a so-called set format. You've got to say the exact words to get saved. We, we did the tract, didn't it? When do you become a Christian? You become a Christian the moment that you quit trusting your own righteousness and you're putting your faith and trust in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'll paraphrase that a little bit there, but it's 2, what is it, 2 Corinthians 5.21. In fact, we'll turn there. It's a brilliant verse. 2 Corinthians 5. If you beat me to it, read it. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we are made the righteousness of God in in him, in Jesus Christ. That's why when we looked at this, justification, it changes your standing. Sanctification changes your character. Regeneration changes your nature. And adoption changes your position. In Christ. You're made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, so you're going to lead someone to the Lord. You hit them with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. 
Romans 10, 9, etc. 2 Timothy 3, 15. But look at this. Turn to Romans 3. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. Somebody read that. Whom God hath set forth. Is it? Um, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. So the through the forbearance of God. Yep. Yeah. And the next one, verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The, that he might be just, the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Faith, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Propitiation occurs three times. 1 John 2.2, 2, 1 John 4.10 and here. In each case it is Jesus Christ himself who sanctifies the demands of God. He, sa- he satisfies the demands of God. We've looked at this, haven't we, when we've gone through the book of Romans. The Father twice declared that he was well pleased with Jesus Christ. Matthew 3, 17 and Matthew 17, 5. The Lord said in Isaiah 53, verse 10 and 11, turn there. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. If you get there before me, read it, please. Yet it pleased the Lord to do it. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul and offer him for sin, he shall see his sin, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the trouble of his soul and shall be satisfied by his loving, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Excellent, well read. So you appropriate that satisfaction when you trust in his blood atonement for you. Without Christ, you're lost. So without Jesus Christ, without putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are lost. Now Romans 3.25 is essential in understanding Acts 2.38. Note the wording in both is remission of sins. Most Christians interpret this to mean in order to get the forgiveness of sins. But this is not what it means. For the remission of sins occurs in the ministry of John the Baptist. Luke 3.3, 3, note baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Again, I'm just reading the notes that we did on this, because I want to take you to a place um, tonight, and you'll understand where I'm going in a second. For the remission of sins occurs at the Last Supper, where Jesus says in Matthew 26, verse 28, you'll have to read that. It also occurs in Acts 2, verse 38, which is not the Gospel. Acts 2, 38 is not the Gospel. You need to understand that. So back to Romans 3.25 and note, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. What sins are these? Those are the sins he forgave from Genesis 3 to Romans 3. How do we know that? Look at the next phrase, through the forbearance of God. Even though not one sin in the Old Testament, listen, was ever taken away. Not one sin was ever taken away. Look at Hebrews 10.4. There is something different. See, if you will understand this tonight, right, if you will understand that there's differences, rightly dividing the word of truth, there is differences. If you realise there's differences in the Old Testament salvation compared to differences in the New Testament salvation, you will then understand, you will then understand a key, that there is also a difference in tribulation salvation. And most Christians don't get that. And they think it's a heresy. If you don't understand salvation during the tribulation, you've missed a great golden nugget of truth there. And they, therefore you will not understand the, really the differences, well, why people argue over the rapture is pre, you know, pre-trib or post-trib, if you don't get the salvation right. Because you are not saved the same way as they were in the Old Testament and you are not saved the same way as you are in the tribulation. And if you can get this, folks, it clears so much up. Look at this. Roman, sorry, Hebrews 10.4. Somebody read it. For it is not possible that the blood of Paul and of God 
Should what? Take away. take away sins. So by the shedding of, of an animal's blood does not take away sins. Even though not one sin in the Old Testament was ever taken away or cleared, look at Exodus 34, look at Exodus 34, verse 7, Come on, Amrit, get your skates on. <laughs> Exodus 34, 7. Go on. Teaching mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will, and that will by no means clear the guilty. By no means clear the guilty. Did you get that? Visiting, yeah, go on. Visiting their iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children and to the third and to the fourth generation. So by no means clear the guilty. So in the Old Testament, folks, you never had your sins taken away and you never had your sins cleared. The Lord put up with those sinners and forgave those sins when they did what he asked them to do until such a time when the one perfect, effectual sacrifice could be made and his righteousness, Jesus Christ, could be applied to all those forgiven sins to absolutely remove them. So, Romans 3, what are we talking? Romans 3, 25 and 26. It has to do with a period of time. Not the time of a man's life. So for the remission of sins means because the sins of the past have already been forgiven, that's what it means. Matthew 26, 28 is a direct cross-reference to Romans 3, 25. You want to look that up. Right, there's loads and loads of things in this, but I'm just trying to lead you to what I want to talk about tonight. You'll understand in a second. So, we start off by saying about faith. Faith is everywhere in the scriptures, but it's only twice in the Old Testament. One is no faith, one is his faith. Strange, why? Because there's a difference between the Old Testament salvation, there's a difference between New Testament salvation. How were you saved? We're looking at how you got saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. For by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, you know, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's also very interesting that the word forgiveness, just a, a little things that have come up just from studying this, the word forgiveness occurs seven times in Scripture, seven being perfection and completion. I thought that was lovely. Forgiveness. You've been totally, perfectly forgiven. I love that. Just a little thing there in biblical numerics. And in regard to forgiveness, look at Colossians 1. Colossians 1, which has been destroyed in so many modern Bibles today, such as the NIV and all the others, ESV, I guess. I haven't checked that out. But Colossians 1 verse 14 says what? Somebody there? See, in whom we have redemption, you've been bought, you've been redeemed through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. You've been purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ. You can never lose your salvation once you've been purchased. Once you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for your sins forgiven, you're in his hand, he's in his Father's hand, you're, you're safe for eternity. You can never lose your salvation. But those words through his blood have been taken out of modern Bibles. And that's a major problem. One, because if, you've, if you cannot get saved without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, but not only that, it's a deeper truth here. In whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins, redemption is different from the forgiveness of sins. Redemption is not the forgiveness of sins, and the forgiveness of sins is not redemption. I can forgive you, but I can't redeem you. You know, when um, Father forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's not universal salvation. There's a difference between the forgiveness of sins and redemption. You've been redeemed by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, we've done that study. So, the words through faith occur 15 times in Scripture. Through faith. All in the New Testament. The words by faith occur 36 times all in the New Testament. Now, look at this. We started off by saying about faith and we turned to Habakkuk 2 verse 4 
which is a cross-reference to Paul quoting it in Romans 1. Turn there. So Romans 1, verse 17, in one hand, Romans 1, 17, and then Habakkuk 2, verse 4, in the other. So Romans 1, 17, the last part says, the just shall live by faith. That's New Testament salvation, that's New Testament gospel. Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. But he's quoting from Habakkuk 2, verse 4, the just shall live by his faith. His faith faith. There is a difference between salvation in the Old Testament and salvation in the New Testament. If you've got another hand, (laughs) turn to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. And then we'll start pulling this together. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 25. Somebody want to read that if you're there? And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. It will be whose righteousness? Our righteousness. Isn't that interesting? Our righteousness. Our righteousness. There's a difference between our righteousness in the Old Testament and the righteousness of the Son of God. Things are different. Folks, if you don't get the differences and if you can't rightly divide the word, you will teach heresy. You will teach things like post-tribulation rapture. You will teach things like Calvinism. Because these kind of Christians just don't divide the scriptures correctly. They wrongly divide the word of truth. You've got to divide it. There's a difference between Old Testament salvation and New Testament salvation. The only way you'll ever understand this book is by reading it dispensationally. It's the only way you'll ever understand it truly. You've got to understand the differences in the dispensations, the differences in the covenants. Differences. Although no person will ever be saved apart from the blood of Christ, Old Testament saints had to exercise their own personal faith, Habakkuk 2.4, which was works in order to eventually have their sins cleared. Notice they weren't cleared, but they are cleared through Jesus Christ but they had to have faith in God and do the correct works. We'll get to that in a little bit. Now, get back to Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, well, we've just read in Deuteronomy 6.25 about our righteousness. Our righteousness is not, in the Old Testament, our righteousness is not the same as the righteousness of God, Look at it, verse 22, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. How are you saved? Your righteousness is the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, which we read. And now, Romans 3, 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and unto all and upon all them that believe. Just what Tony said at the start. So when you say believe, yes, exactly, believing and trusting and putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you will not go wrong. For there is no difference. Listen, you can, you can, you know, you can be a cult. If you add anything onto the gospel, you're preaching another gospel. If you're adding works onto the gospel, it's another gospel. If you're adding baptism onto the gospel, it's another gospel. If you're adding circumcision or keeping the commandments or doing the law or Sabbath keeping, it's another gospel. Because today, it is not of works, but it was back then in the Old Testament. And folks, it is going to be in the tribulation. Rightly divide the book. If it goes back to faith and works in the tribulation, you know that you are saved by grace through faith, not of works. Therefore, the church cannot go through the tribulation. You're saved before it. You get saved, you know, out of not not during it. You're saved before it happens. Because salvation is different in the tribulation. Get it? Look at Romans 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore being justified, and don't forget, justified has nothing to do, there's no water associated with justification. You are justified, not with water, not by circumcision, not by law keeping and commandments, not by Sabbath keeping. You are justified, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus 
Christ. It's faith in Jesus Christ. You're justified by, his, justified by faith, justified by the blood of Christ. Look at Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 11. That no man, but that no man is justified by the law. In the sight of God it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Not of works, not the law. Nothing except faith in Jesus Christ. There is a fantastic verse in Galatians 2.20. Look at that. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a fantastic uh, verse that is. Now, I just put in again a concordance. Just those two words, justified by. What are we justified by? Now, look at these amazing verses. Again, it's a shame we just can't stop and talk about all of them, but... Acts 13, Acts 13, verse 38 and 39, look at this. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that's Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, Jesus Christ, all that believe, there it is again, are justified from all things, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. The law of Moses cannot justify you. Acts 13, verse 38 and 39. Now, back to Romans. That's why Romans is a... We've said it before, I keep saying this, but get into Romans, get into Galatians, get into Ephesians, get into Timothy, and get away from Acts... (laughs) And get away from Matthew and James and Hebrew. I'm not saying don't study them, but you'll get, you'll get her- every heresy, you'll find that nearly every heresy that is preached is a tribulation passage heresy. Matthew is to do with the Jews. Jacob's trouble. Acts is a transitional book from Jew to Gentile, from the nation of Israel to the individual Christian, the Bible-believing Christian. James to the 12 tribes. And Hebrews... <laughs> Self-explanatory. And don't forget, it's Acts of the Apostles. Get that. Acts of the Apostles. Romans 3.28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 5. We've looked at verse 1, look at verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by his blood. Now listen, if you're justified by the blood of Jesus Christ... Listen carefully. We shall be saved from wrath through him. If you're, su- if you're justified by the blood of Jesus Christ and Colossians 1 verse 14 misses out the blood of Christ in your Bible, that's satanic. Because you cannot get saved without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I get a lot of Christians saying, oh, they don't, the, the, the hymns aren't, um, I've heard this before, this makes me smile, the hymns aren't like they used to be, they miss out the blood now. That's absolutely correct, they're not. But it's worse than that. The Bibles miss out the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the people with the NIVs that are saying, the the hymns aren't the same as they used to be. You're using a Bible that misses out the blood of Jesus Christ. Talk about hypocrisy. Get your foundation right. Look at Galatians 2.16, another fantastic verse. Galatians 2.16. If you're there, read it please. Come on, Speedy. <laughs> Galatians 2.16. I'm timing you. Knowing that. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Not justified, yep. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might... It's as if Paul is really hammering home this, it's Jesus Christ, it's only Jesus Christ. You're not justified by the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. That's what it's all about. That's, it's the Lord 
Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.4. Galatians 5.4. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye have fallen from grace. Listen, that's not talking about losing your salvation and that kind of stuff, right? Fallen from grace here. But you have become of no effect unto you, whosoever are justified by the law. It's not the law that justifies you. We've got the Galatians study if you want to go through that. And the last one in regard to this is Titus. Titus 3. Titus 3, verse 7. If you're there, read it out loud. That being justified by his grace... We should be made as according to the hope of eternal life. Fantastic. Justified by his grace, justified by his faith, justified by blood. Notice, no water, no works, no law, no circumcision, no Sabbath keeping, no speaking in tongues. Da, 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 da. None of that justified. I had a little smile down the end. I liked it. <laughs> I love it. Right, look at this. Okay, so we've gone through this, right? Justified by, justified by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, faith in Christ, faith in Christ. It's only Jesus Christ. Yet look at, let's turn to one of these books that that can cause a lot of problems. Let's turn to the book of James. Anyone dare go there? Let's turn to the book of James. Pentecostals are already there. Um, James, I'm joking. (laughs) I'm joking, Manjit. James chapter 2. Verse 21, look at this. James 2, 21 and 25. James 2, 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by faith? Is that what it says? It says works. Isn't that interesting? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see... That's, that's a passage a Mormon will take you to straight away because they can teach works from that passage. Like we said before, you can teach anything from this book. Just distort it, pull it out of context. Look at, it goes on. Look at verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by faith? No. Justified by what? Works. Now listen, the Bible says that they were justified by Works, And if you talk to somebody who's suddenly thinking, oh yeah, but it, it, it doesn't really mean this, it means they were justified in the eyes of God, in the eyes of man, run the eyes... Listen, it says justified by works. And it gives you two, two, two characters, Abraham and Rahab. Both of them found where? Old Testament. You getting this? It's not faith... By grace he saved through faith in the Old Testament. They were justified by works. When a Mormon takes you to this passage straight away, they cannot differentiate, they cannot tell the difference between, we've said this before, imputed righteousness and justification. You are made righteous. You are made the righteousness of God. Justification changes your standing. Sanctification changes your character. Regeneration changes your nature. Adoption changes your position. You are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus the moment you trust in the Lord. You're baptised into the... Loads of things happen to you. You don't even realise what's happened to you until we study this. You're baptised by the Spirit into the body of Christ. You're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have imputed righteousness. You have justification. The moment you quit trusting your own righteousness and put your faith and trust in the righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ. Amazing. Remember when we did that study that um, all the things that we get when you become a Christian? That list and list, loads of things. But here, here, it goes back. Look at this, it says, um, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had what? Offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Do you remember when we looked at the book of Romans where it says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for... Righteousness. Well, it just says here that Abraham, our father, was justified by works. Do you know why? Because there's a difference between imputed righteousness when you believe and when you work and do what's right, then you are justified. That is Old Testament. So Abraham, when God says you're going to be a father of many nations, he, had, he believed what God said. 
So he got imputed righteousness there and then. But he did not get, and that, that was in Genesis 15. But he did not get justification until he had worked out. He had to do some works. And that works was to offer his son up, which was not chapter 15, was chapter 22. So from that time, he, of 15 he gets imputed righteousness, to chapter 22, justification, comes. those two things happened at two separate times. So when the Mormons straight away, they say, oh well, you know, faith without works is dead, and they straight away take you to James, they quote this passage, has nothing to do with you, it has to do with Abraham, when he got imputed righteousness in Genesis 15, and justification in chapter 22. But they don't rightly divide it. So they pull a verse out of the book of James and they teach a doctrine that is heretical. Heresy. Okay. So, works in regard to those characters, both verses found in the Old Testament. Now this is interesting. I'm just going to throw this out as well. You know that, you know, um, if I said to you, when you die, where do you go? What are you going to tell me? Heaven! Somebody shouted heaven! That young lady down there. Okay? How do we know? A verse in the New Testament that tells me, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. What are you going to use? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You good girl, you. Yeah, absent from the body, present with the Lord. The moment you die, you're straight into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great verse to use. Now, in the Old Testament, what were the Old Testament saints looking forward to after death? This is interesting. If you're going to make notes, you write this down. Eternal life, listen carefully. The words eternal life occur in 26 verses. Every single one of those verses is found in the New Testament. Isn't that interesting? Everlasting life occurs in 11 verses. Only once is one of those verses found in the Old Testament, and that is in Daniel 12, verse 2. Daniel 12, verse 2, which says... And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, remember this. When it talks about sleep in the dust, as a, a born-again Christian in the New Testament, when it talks about sleep and death and things like this, your body sleeps, your soul doesn't. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Your body sleeps, decays and rots away, but your soul goes to heaven or hell. In the Old Testament, your soul and your body were stuck together. In the New Testament, your soul and body has been separated through spiritual circumcision. Colossians chapter 2. We've done the studies on it. Remember that? So in the Old Testament, there was no body of Christ... There was no circumcision, spiritual circumcision. There was many things different in the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. Salvation is different in the Old Testament compared to salvation in the New Testament. Get that right. Differences. So, what were the Old Testament saints looking forward to after death? Everlasting life? Eternal life? Well, we're not told much about it in the Old Testament, but there's a few little inklings here. Look at this, Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. It's not the angels, that's the Trinity. To know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live for a period of time. Is that what it says? It says, Live for ever. Everlasting life. Very interesting. Look at Job. 
You want to write these down if you've never done this before. Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19 verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand. My wife's smiling here. (laughs) She's telling me off now. She can sing this one. But I won't get her to sing because it's only embarrass her. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though, listen, though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Isn't that interesting? Whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another though my reins be consumed within me. He knew that even after he was dead that he was going to see God at some point in the future. Fascinating. Fascinating. Look at Psalm 23. Just got to press on because of time, otherwise we could talk about these verses for ages. Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the Old Testament saying this. Forever. Look at Psalm 17. Psalm 17, verse 15. And if there's, if you've got a name beginning with A tonight, perhaps you'd read that. As for me, oh, I am Rick. Yes. Go. As for me, I will behold thy faith, faith in the righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wait with thy righteousness. Don't you think that's incredible? That's an amazing verse. This is David, right? David expected, right, to be resurrected with God's likeness. See, David was special in the sense of the sure mercy of God, which we've touched upon, may touch upon that again um, this evening. But the sure mercy, there was something different about that. He had the eternal security even in the Old Testament. Nobody else did. You could lose your salvation in the Old Testament. You could lose your salvation in the Old Testament. You can't today. In the tribulation you can. Hence why we don't go through the tribulation because you cannot lose your salvation. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. I found that fascinating. Look at Psalm 21 verse 4. He asked life of thee and thou gavest him. Gavest it him, even length of days, forever and ever. And then Daniel 12, 2, we've, we've talked about, we've said. Look at the last one here, I just want to show you. Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26, verse 19. Thy dead men shall live. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Isn't that interesting? What a verse. What an amazing verse. So, this leads me on what I want to speak about tonight. (laughs) <laughs> How about that for an introduction? I'm, uh, a, half you think, oh no, I can't take them all this. That's only 45 minutes now, oh, come on. Get a life, girls and boys. Right, I'm not going to, I won't be able to do all this, obviously. But if you turn, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. Turn to the book of Ezekiel. Fascinating stuff this is. Ezekiel. <clears throat> now, I'm going to read to you. And you, I'm going to emphasise some of the words. You follow me down. This is incredible. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, I'm going to read, carry on reading a second, I'm going to ask you a question. The question is this. 
Is there a difference between salvation in the Old Testament compared to salvation in the New Testament? Yes or no? In the New Testament, you're saved by what? By faith, by grace, not of works. In the Old Testament, you're saved by faith and works. Let's carry on reading. Verse 5. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife's a wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. Do you know what you're just reading there? Works, 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 and works. Faith in God and works. If a man be just and do, and then he gives you a list of works, works, works. Verse 8. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, and hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly, he is just. He shall surely live saith the Lord God. Works, works, works. If he does the right works, the right works, and has the right faith, he's just. His sins are not cleared, his sins are not taken away, they are covered, awaiting for the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Look at this. If he begat a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any one of these, and that doeth not any of those duties, but hath, but even hath eaten upon the mountains, and did fold his neighbour's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, that has goes on and up, works, works, works. Look at verse 19. Yet say ye, why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father, when the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and have done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You see, that's another one, listen, that's another one that a Jehovah's Witness will take you to. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's talking purely on works. You see, if you can rightly divide this book and see that salvation in the Old Testament is different to salvation in the New Testament, you will understand better how to deal with the cults and deal with the post-tribbers. Because they want to take you, they want to be try and be clever and say things, well, what about this? Listen, talk about salvation. How do you get saved? How do you stay saved? Is it of works, not of works? They can't answer that. Look at this. Verse 20, the soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous... Did you get that? Remember it's looking at our righteousness compared to the righteousness of the Son of God? Deuteronomy 6.5 compared to the righteousness of the Son of God was in Romans. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Look at verse... Look at this, verse... Um, in fact, we'll carry on. Verse 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. You see, this is another thing where the hyperdipers go wrong, the hyperdispensationists, when they're saying, oh, well, there's no repentance, and they preach a gospel without repentance, and then you get the other um, Christians saying, well, you've got to preach repentance. All this stuff, they don't realise that the word repentance has different meanings in the scriptures, but they don't study that. But here... But if the wicked shall turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes, that's faith and works, folks. You don't have to do that. Some of you, well, some of you, you probably all sinned today. Thought wrong things. Said wrong things. Tony said he got angry before he come. But that's because of the Muslims. That doesn't matter. (laughs) 
I thought it was funny. <laughs> Be angry with the Muslims. Listen, keep all my statutes. Do that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live and shall not die. Goes on. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his, in his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. It is so clear. It is so clear that it's faith and works. It's his righteousness, our righteousness. It's his faith. It's his faith. Not the faith in the Son of God. Not the, um, the righteousness of the Son of God. But his faith, his, his righteousness. Have I any pleasure at, at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God? And not that he should return from his ways and live. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Look at John 8, 24. Keep your finger there. John 8, 24. Cross reference that. John eight twenty four. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Verse Ezekiel eighteen verse twenty four, the last part. In his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. You die in your sins. Or you die with your sins forgiven. And then verse 27, and then we're going to wrap it up. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right works, he shall save his soul alive. Don't forget the soul and the soul and the body were interchangeable in the Old Testament, stuck together, but not in the New Testament. There's differences. Now, let me read you this. This is very, very interesting. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. Just a note here. There is a righteousness of the law. You want to write this down, the verses, because I haven't got time to look them up with you. There is a righteousness of the law. Romans 2, 26. Romans 8, verse 4. Whatever happens, look them up. And there is a righteousness of God. Two different righteousnesses. Romans 1, 17. Romans 3, 5. And verse 21. Romans 3.21 and Romans 3.22. Romans 10.3. 2 Corinthians 5.21. So there's a righteousness of the law, there is a righteousness of God. They are different. They are different. The personal righteousness, Deuteronomy 6.25, our righteousness, was the basis for the believer's eternal destiny. And if he was righteous, according to Ezekiel 18.20, he would make it. And if he was wicked, according to Ezekiel 18.20, he would be turned into hell. Psalm 9.17. Psalm 9.17. Listen carefully. Under the law, a saint not only is not cleared, Exodus 34.7, but his sins are not taken away, Hebrews 10.4. And if that weren't enough, He dies in his sins if he does not live right. Faith and works. A sinner who dies in his sins, John 8, 24 we looked at, cannot go where Jesus Christ went. John 8, 21. If you look these verses up, it will be a blessing. Get the CD and you can pause it in that. Under the law, the righteous saint dies in his sins... With his iniquities on him. They are not imputed to Christ. The righteous man doesn't go to hell. There is a difference between Old Testament righteousness of the law and the righteousness which is of faith. In the Old Testament, God gave physical rules for physical life and they did play a part in a person's spiritual salvation after death. Even in Luke 16, you know, the rich man and Lazarus, the basis for the rich man going to hell is unbelievable. Look at this. Look at this. Look at Ezekiel. In fact, turn to Luke 16. You've got to turn here. 
Again, this, was, this has been missed so often. I've missed this so often, found this out, thought this is fantastic. Even in Luke 16, the basis for the rich man going to hell... Turn to Luke 16. Let me just find this for you. We'll go from verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain a beggar named Lazarus which was laid at, the, at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice both those, how they, how they got to their destinations in that sense. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Hell, there's torments. And seeing Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. This is, gonna, <laughs> this is amazing, this is. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, listen, here it comes. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Now, turn to Ezekiel 18 and look at verse 12. We've just read Ezekiel 18 talking about works, works, works. Look at verse 12. Hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abomination. Do you know what he did? He oppressed the poor and needy. Do you know why he went to hell? In Luke 16, the basis for the rich man going to hell was his bad works. Luke 16 is previous to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was still, theoretically speaking, under the Old Testament. He's given an account here of something that happened pre-crucifixion. Do you understand that? It's faith and works. He oppressed the poor, therefore he went to hell. He had the wrong faith and the wrong works. It's incredible. I've never seen that before. You never look at that before. If those of you have grabbed that, that's a little nugget for you. Because I've never known that before. Because it's one that we take... Because Think about this as well. This will help you. Is A lot of the New Testament is still standing in the Gospels. A lot of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, a lot of that, the majority of the Gospels are still standing in the Old Testament. Because remember when we looked at, was it last week, the week before, when we talked about the death of the testator? The New Testament was only, it only came into being when the death of the testator happened, which happens to be Jesus Christ. Then the New Testament came into force. So up until Luke 23, the crucifixion, up until Matthew 27 and John and Mark where, you know, the crucifixion takes place, it's standing, all those previous chapters are standing doctrinally in the Old Testament. That'll help you out, help you to study, if you can get that. So, finishing off. Uh, we've done our time tonight, and I haven't really said hardly anything what I wanted to say. It's always the way in it. Look at this. I'm going to read this to you. There's, um, there's so much on this, but it's so, this is such a good, great study when you study it. The Old Testament saint, under the law, must perform the works, Deuteronomy 28.14, as an evidence of his faith. James 2.21. These works do not justify him, Galatians 3.11, unless faith accompanies them. It has to be the right faith, the right works. Hebrews 11.39 and 40. He lives by doing. You've just read that in Ezekiel 18. Doing. Faith and works. Faith and works. Doing. And when he quits doing, Psalm 51.11, he has had it. Judges 16.20. So you want to look all these up. God can take his spirit from him permanently, like he did Saul in the Old Testament. He took his spirit permanently. Or temporarily, he took Samson's spirit temporarily, until Samson cried out to God and for forgiveness and repentance, and God, the spirit of God comes upon Samson again. He pushes the pillars over, and he takes his own life in that sense, but then he's still a hero of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So, permanently, he takes Saul. Temporarily, Samson, the spirit that leaves him, comes back to him. And with, with David, he had eternal security. He had the sure mercies of God, which is, again, like um, singled out, an exception to the rule. David was.
But even under the law, exceptions are made. 2 Samuel 12, 13 in regard to David. Grace is everywhere manifest in the life... Listen, this is fascinating. Grace is everywhere manifest in the life of Samson, who never repents, he never confesses, he never restores anything one time in a lifetime of continued transgression. But he still made it. He had the right faith and he did the right works in that sense. Eternal security is unknown in the Old Testament apart from the Psalms of David, Psalm 91 verse 14 to 16, who was given the sure mercies of God, Acts 13, 34, that other men were not given, 2 Samuel 7, 14. In the Old Testament, the just lives by his faith, Habakkuk 2, 4, which you looked at, whereas the New Testament believers, um, believer lives by the faith of the Son of God, Galatians 2, 20. Oh, it's a fascinating study, folks. All I'm trying to get through to you tonight is that in regard to salvation in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they are different. Because they are different, we could break down every dispensation and salvation is different. You've got to understand the differences. And then once you understand the difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll understand about the tribulation salvation. And if you get that right, you won't fall for this heresy of post-tribulation rubbish. It makes so much sense when you rightly divide the book. If we'd have had the time, we'd have, um, there's a lot more we'd have said on that. Um, obviously, we looked at the verse as well. And then I would have shown you again how the signs come in from Exodus chapter 4 in regard to Israel and go through all the way until the signs die out with the Acts of the Apostles. They get picked up again during the tribulation because it's called Jacob's trouble. And we'd have gone through that as well. Time has beaten us again. Amen.